All right, back for episode four uh, in uh, the James Cook podcast. The Lubbock music scene, always been a town for incredible talent. Uh, songwriters like Josh Abbott, William Clark Green, Flatland Calvary, all hell from the music hub. My guest today has been responsible for launching the careers of some of our favorite Texas red dirt artists from West Texas and beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring you Mr. David Wild. How you doing, buddy? Good, man. It's good to see you. You look healthy. Thank I you. miss you. I, I miss wish we you. could hang out. You know, um, soon it was this soon. Is, this is we'll close. This yeah, is close. for sure. I, now you, I, you, 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 you were being uh, very generous when you said I was responsible for the launching of careers. I like to think those guys did it themselves. That's oh, the first, first and foremost, those guys put in the hard work, guys and gals. And uh, I, I've heard people say that before. I'm like, I just, I don't know. I feel a little uncomfortable with that. You know, uh, I totally Cordero understand. is the guy that put in the work for that. I just played him on the radio because I like his music. I'm just a fan. Yeah, and that's where I think. A lot of that starts for us. I'm you, sure it's you, the same you, for you. A great way to look at some talent. And honestly, uh, I think every time I've ever come visit with you and I've just sat down and talked with you, I just sit down and just listen to your stories because I love the fact that you have been in the middle. And this is all I've known you for was the middle of this Lubbock explosion. Dalton Domino, right. guys like that. And I just wanted to learn everything that you knew about how you help cultivate it. Now, I know you may not be responsible for the careers, but you had a great ecosystem that you had let me know about in the Lubbock scene. So we're going to talk about that also. But sure. I kind of want to start with some origins, which I always love to do. Uh, and what's funny is when I brought it up to you the other day, I said, hey, I want to talk about your origins. You had mentioned yeah. – that you started from Oklahoma and you were part of that yeah. crazy scene. So let's first, let's start with where you grew up in. What city did you grew up in? Well, that's a, <laughs> I'm an uh, army brat. So I've lived all over the world. I've lived, uh, I was born in Yakima, Washington. That was where okay. I was born. I uh, lived mostly in Texas, um, lived in Panama, Central America, Panama, Panama Canal. I uh, lived, I mean, you can see the ships going in and out of the canal from my backyard. I was about 14, 15, 16. It was a really cool time. Uh, I lived in Germany when I was real little. I mean, so I've been all over, but but I do consider myself a Texan. Uh, yeah. I graduated high school from Angleton, Texas, which is south of Houston. So if there's a hometown, I'd say Angleton was probably it. Okay. So what brought uh, – whenever you were out there in, near Houston, did you listen to the radio growing up? Did you did you have anybody that – I did. Uh, you know, it's it's funny. So many years – a lot of years have gone by. But there was this, this old – I think it was uh, – Correct me if I'm wrong. It was like the Bull or something. There was a there was a really cool uh, country radio station down there at the time. This is back in the '80s, a long time ago, yeah. and uh, it was just uh, the George Straits, the Merle Haggards, the Alan Jack. You know what I mean? They're just the, the classics. Yeah. And uh, and and that's that's something I I really miss on radio these days. You don't get those guys as much. So that's just a personal thing. But anyway, yeah. a station that really really uh, to me still it seems like a, a staple for me is KATT out of Oklahoma city. It's a rock station, a oh, rock. Wow. Uh, it's, it's the cat and they, man, those guys know how to rock and roll. That's probably yeah. one of my, uh, the stations I really looked at and admired a lot of the jocks on that station and kind of emulated some of what they did. So, so you uh, did the Oklahoma scene. When about was that whenever you moved to Oklahoma, started DJing out there? It was around 2000, 2001. Um, so yeah, a lot of years ago, um, it started out as me DJ nightclubs, uh, I worked for this club in Oklahoma city called, uh, it was called city walk and it was like seven clubs under one roof. And one of the rooms, one of the bigger rooms was a country club and they knew I liked country music. And so they kind of threw me up there. I didn't know how to DJ. I just kind of learned it as I was going along. I made a lot of mistakes at first, but they liked my voice. There was something, they liked my voice on a microphone and I was always real nervous to talk on a mic. It's funny that when I, Looking back now, it doesn't bother me one bit. But that first, you know, year or so, every time I turn on that mic, I just, I'd almost freeze up. Yeah. That doesn't happen anymore. Um, and so it, it's kind of funny that I was working the, in the in the nightclub, and one of the local uh, program directors was doing a, a live remote there, and he had just fired some guy for not showing up or something like that. He was really pretty pissed off at the time. Yeah. And he comes up to the DJ booth. He goes, "Man, you got a great voice. You ever thought about doing radio?" Like, man, I kind of thought you had to have a degree for that. I thought you had to go to all this school for that. He goes, no, no, I just need a good overnight guy. You've got a great voice. Come in and do some reads for me tomorrow. We're going to see how you sound recorded, and we'll go from there. And sure enough, that was my first – that's how I got started. Right cool. There. So I was doing clubs and overnight radio at the same time. And it was at a country station? Yes, it was uh, It was called 96.9 The Bull out of Oklahoma City. Yeah. And uh, it was sort of this really neat hybrid station. It, and – that's kind of where the red dirt, you were, we were bringing up the, the original red dirt stuff. 
um, they tried something different. Now, back then, they didn't have all the music that we have now to support an entire Texas Red Dirt radio station like we do now. It was this weird hybrid. Uh, so we'd be playing like Cross Canadian Ragweed, Great Divide, and then some Toby Keith and Shania Twain. It was this weird kind of mix. And, of yeah. course, it didn't work because people that are into Red Dirt don't really like those things crossing, you know, crossing over. So we, we were on the air for a couple of years. They pulled the plug on it. The ratings weren't very good at the time. And, uh, and then they flipped us over to a classic rock station. They kept me on, thankfully. They, they got rid of a few people. But they kept me on. I think because I was so cheap at the time. That's probably what it was. I didn't yeah. cost anything to work. But that's kind of how it started. And in that time, you know, I was living in Edmond, Oklahoma, which is not far from Stillwater. And we would go. I remember being just broke, broke, man. I was in college, taking classes, uh, working, you know, these little radio jobs and DJ jobs. I didn't have a lot of money. And but I would take whatever little money we had, and we'd take those little trips to Stillwater, Oklahoma, to the original Wormy Dog. It's a name you might yeah. be familiar with. Yeah. And that was when Cross Canadian Ragweed was new. Nobody, they weren't on radio at that time. Great Divide was out uh, doing their thing. Uh, Mike McClure was as crazy then as he is now. Shout outs to Mike McClure there at Boo Hut. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, No Justice, man, they were a cool band. Um, still are, of course. Uh, there was a band called Rambler. Look this one up when we're done with this. W R A M B L E R. Okay. You want to think of it? Find a cool band that never quite made it to the level of cross Canadian ragweed, but they were part of that group back then, and, and just a wonderful Texas red dirt sounding sounding group. But yeah, we used to. I used to take the little twenty bucks I had and go to Stillwater, go to the Wormy Dog, and and pay that little five dollar cover to see cross Canadian ragweed live That's at cr- concert. That's awesome. Five bucks. Five bucks. Of course, that was all the money in the world to me back then. Yeah. You know, that's uh, that's 25% of, of your nights, your nights partying. I'd go down there. Yeah, I'd That'll work. With, with 20 bucks and go, well, I guess I'm having three beers tonight. All right. Uh, it's, uh, so you were part of this. So the, the music scene in Stillwater, Oklahoma is exploding with all these acts that we know as just kings now. Um, right, so right. When was the time where you made the transition from Oklahoma to Lubbock? Well, that's, that's kind of interesting. I was, during my whole radio career in Oklahoma City, I never quite got to where I wanted to go. Um, there was always that, you know, a few promotions I kind of got passed over on. And so I started, honestly, I got a little bit, and I was ready to make a change. And so I took an opportunity here in Lubbock. There was a, uh, a club that was based out of Oklahoma City called Club Rodeo. It had live bull riding inside of it. And uh, it was this massive building that had live bull riding, great honky tonk, great, great place to go and dance and have a good time. And uh, they offered me a job to come to Lubbock and start full time. And they, you know, working for the club. And I knew, I was like, well, Lubbock's kind of a neat market. They've got some neat things going on there. And I'm thinking, okay, maybe I can kind of break into radio there while I'm doing the club thing and get a paycheck. And slowly, but surely that's exactly what happened. I finally got my foot in the door. I worked for a classic rock station here for the first couple of years I was here. And then my opportunity came up with uh, my former station, Red Dirt Rebel. I don't mind giving them a big shout because I had a lot of great years over there. And uh, started out just, just, just DJing. And uh, next thing you know, they said, man, you've really got a kind of an ear for this music. And they, they, they turned me into the program director and the music director. And, and I ran the thing for six years. Six years. That's awesome. And that's during that time. During that time is when we started seeing the Dalton Dominoes and the Randall Kings and Flatland Calvary and, and so many bands out there. Uh, of the Hog Mollies, man. Oh, what a great band they are. Uh, they were oh, yeah. their, at their height at that time. And uh, Whiskey Myers was a new band, you know. Think ah, about that. Yeah, Whiskey dude, Myers I, was brand new. That's crazy. Yeah. Whiskey Myers, um, a young Whiskey Myers is fun to think. A young about. Whiskey Myers. I know that you had told oh, me once fine. about Mr. Dalton Domino uh, coming up to you with a, with this <laughs> with, with his new with his new music. About, I think yeah. you, I, I think you were telling me a story. I can't I, I can't remember all the details, but I remember you saying uh, that you were working. That he was working somewhere, and he knew who you were. Yeah, yeah. He, he, I'll give Dalton this much. Um, you may not, he, he, he hides it well, but boy, when he was hungry, it was this, uh, this, he had this fire in him. He didn't care who got in his way. He was, he didn't care how he looked. He was going to get the attention of the right people. And it was funny. I was, I was at the Coles, I think it was. He was, he was the, he was working security, loss prevention. So he was an undercover guy looking for people to, that were stealing. And, and I'm sitting there with my son. We're looking for sheets or pillows or something, something you buy at Kohl's. I can't remember what it was. And geez, he comes around the corner. Hey, you know, Dalton Domino's voice. Hey, you, hey, hey, you're David Wild. Hey, you're David Wild. Man, you, you need to hear my music. And I mean, he's just so loud. The whole section of Kohl's, everybody was like watching us. And I'm just sitting there just kind of with my kid. My kid was like three at the time. But he's like, dad, who's this guy? You know, 
ironically, uh, Dylan, my son, and Dalton are best friends now. Oh, cool. um, but yeah, just, I mean, that, and, and I'll tell you what, it made an impression because I remember seeing them at the Blue Line. I remember seeing them playing, you know, singer songwriter nights, but it, you know, it really didn't sink in until he made that move at Cole's. I never forgot. He's one of my best friends, former roommate, actually. And we've been best friends or good friends anyway for a very, very long time. That's and uh, I worry about the kid. He's like a little brother. Uh, yeah. I worry about him because I know how he is. And I know how talented he is. And uh, oh, there's a lot of uh, responsibility that comes with that. So. Yeah, definitely. Whatever uh, you told me the stories of of meeting Dalton and meeting all them, and I believe uh, when me and you, me and you have gotten in some great conversations. Whenever I go to, sure. Rome, I absolutely love them. And one of them was when I first hung out with you. I think I was opening for Chance Anderson and No Dry County. It was a really cool, yeah. Movie. And we were just chilling, and like halfway through the conversation, we had talked about this ecosystem that I was like, that's, yeah. and I'm sure other stations have done this, and it's it's the way that the system works. But at that mm -hmm. time. I had a, I really didn't know how to work the station I worked for. It yeah. was really hard to get through. And uh, you had, you had shed some light on the ecosystem, which was bar, uh, a musician plays for bar, bar, you know, does stuff with the station, station works with the artists and it just kind of helps each other out, right. building each other's careers and helping each other. And one of the things I remember th thinking was how cool is that, that he gets on Monday nights to go to a bar to, cause we're right in front of, at blue light whenever we were doing this conversation yeah so to go to blue light on monday yeah. hang out with because at blue lights at least when i first started going to to open mic nights i remember freaking out that there was like awesome artists that were there just hanging out not really to play like yeah. i remember saying does red shahan play here and uh, uh dustin six said yeah he's right there at the end of the bar like it was just yeah. there so yeah, i remember, was hanging out yeah, he was just hanging. And I remember thinking, God, how cool is that? That you get to, you kind of got first dibs on all this incredible talent that were just doing open mics at the time before they yeah. were really even doing full shows at Blue Light. Yeah, you're, 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 I like that you brought up that, that ecosystem because I think that is very important. And some markets have that better than others. Um, yeah. You know, I, I'll use Oklahoma City as an example. If they had more radio support up there in Oklahoma City, they'd have a wonderful ecosystem going. They don't have the radio support. I don't know why. I think maybe because it's such a big city, they're, they're mostly corporate radio stations, which yeah. aren't as likely to do this brand of music. Usually you have to find an independent or somebody that's willing to take a chance. And, you know, some of the, I'm not going to call out any of the major business, but you know the big ones. Um, yeah. They're not as likely to go, yeah, let's try this Texas country thing. So maybe that's part of it. Um, but it is so important because you have to have all of those pieces. And if you're missing one, it's not going to work. So if the venues aren't booking the bands and the, the bands aren't getting out in front of the crowds and getting the fa building fans that way, if the radio station um, isn't playing the music and then you've got that little part of the ecosystem where the, the, the live venues are spending money in advertisement to keep that radio station going, that radio station is bringing these new artists up for the, for the venue to, to play at their, at their place. And then, of course, you know, it's just that. Uh, and then having a great pool of, of musicians. Yeah. And I don't know, how, how do you... How do you I think that's just like Lubbock's very fortunate. We get a lot of people that come here because they know the music scene is here, but how do you start that? How, you know, if you're a, a smaller town that's trying to trying to do what we're doing here in Lubbock, how do you get that going? I don't know the answer to that, yeah. but you got You got to have that pool of, of talent. So you know, and, and hardworking talent. So whenever you go to the shows at blue light, has there been any shows that you can think of? that's just magical nights. Like you just couldn't believe that you got to be a part of this night. Anything stick, stick out, come at you? Yeah, there was, there was one. And I, it's funny because I actually have a, a picture to, to remember it. I don't know if it was one of the ones I sent you or not, but um, I'm, it was William Clark Green was, it was just kind of a surprise concert. He, I can't remember what the details were, but he was like, Hey man, I got the time. They got the opening. Let's just do a show. And so it, there was no time to plan or promote or anything like that. Of course, people still showed up. That's how Lubbock is. And then out of the blue, Sam Riggs shows up. And before you know it, Will's got me on stage. We're sitting there smoking cigarettes, doing shots, and watching Sam Riggs play. And the crowd was just, I mean, on fire. And that's one of those nights that really stands out for me. That really was. There's yeah. a number of them. Um, but it was like Sam, Sam Riggs just showed up. We, he was like passing through Lubbock and said, I'm going to go to Blue Light. That's the beauty of, of, of Lubbock. If any of these artists are passing through town, they got to stop by Blue Light. And at least say hi, have a burn shot. You know what I mean? So. Definitely. That's how you know you've been there, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. The burn shot is always something I laugh at because I remember being at Larry Joe Taylor Festival one year and <laughs> somebody yes. handing me a drink and me not even like questioning it, just like, right. and I was like, 
why do I feel like I'm in Lubbock? And the girl next to me goes, I bartend at Blue Light. And it was so, before you could buy it in a, in a bottle. Now you can buy right, it in bottles. Right. I was going to say, they, they brought out that, uh, that concentrate. And I don't know if you remember, they talked some cowboy into just drinking a shot of a straight habanero concentrate. It was the most entertaining 40 minutes of LJT for me that entire, entire week I was there. <laughs> I want to bring it up the time that we thought we killed you, by the way. Oh, let's not bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll leave that alone. There's, it was a night where, honestly, I, I, let me say this also. I don't, I don't, I can't remember a time in my life when I had such good friends that were genuinely <laughs> concerned. I think we killed James. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I literally broke into your camper, and you're like, "What? I'm just sleeping." You know? I was just, you're, you're, I was just exhausted yeah. and tired, and I guess old. <laughs> it was like throughout the entire day, we're walking around, we're going and visiting with people, and people, are, "Where's James? Where's James? Where's James?" I'm like, "It's been like 12, 13, 14 hours, and nobody's seen James." And we found you. <laughs> he was fine. He was fine. I was fine. I was just sleeping. I was just, uh, I'm honestly, I just was exhausted, <laughs> and I think a lot of people don't realize this. Uh, when I go to festivals, that's at most of the time, not right now, of course, but most of the time, that's, that's yeah. my vacation, my vacation. Yeah, yeah, I too. finally me get too. to not be responsible for show, for playing a show. I don't have to yeah. do radio. I mean, I, it's, we have to, but it's right. small and it's in between having a good time with my friends. So yeah. uh, to me, it's like, no, nah, I'm, I got no more yeah. said, I'll be sleeping. I'm going to sleep in. Yeah. Take that opportunity. See, you guys were you, concerned. I'm got- grateful for it. You've, you've got the kids at home and you've got the, the family responsibility. So I imagine you get a, a day to sleep for an extra 10 hours. Why not? They go, go for it. Man. Oh, it's a beautiful thing. I, I sat down and like binge watch stuff. It's funny. Cause you, I'm binge watching stuff on my computer and I can hear a festival going on. In the back right. <laughs> I don't feel like being <laughs> right now. I feel like being lazy right now. We'll wait till the sun goes down. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So. So uh, you, I, this is a question that I love asking uh, because we hang out with Texas Red Dirt artists. I don't know if you freaked out over some artists. I know one artist that I freaked out over was Hayes Coral. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I don't really freak out over that many people, but I've, I've met some great famous people out there uh, doing radio. Is there anybody that you got the chance to sit down and talk to you? Like, I can't believe I'm talking to such and such. Absolutely. And, and this is still brings truth to that for some reason. This particular artist, and I think because we talked about earlier me going to shows in Stillwater and watching those guys kind of, I kind of grew up watching these guys. So I, I these were rock stars to me. And that, that's Cody Canada, man. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, he, when he walks in the room, I'm like, that's a, that's a true, that's a rock star. That Dude, guy he looks like a rock star. star. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and in my mind, uh, and <laughs> in my mind, it might as well have been Jimmy Page walking through the door. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, you know, yeah. just the, just, just the, that. And, you know, and I remember doing an interview with him and being kind of nervous. And I don't get starstruck. Anymore. Yeah. And I, but for some reason, I think because I was so young when I started watching him and I've, all these years have passed and I've always looked up to his music. I've always been a huge fan of his. And, you know, even when he left Cross Canadian Ragweed and they're doing, the, you know, his own little side thing, the, the Departed thing. Um, I've just what, followed every album. And so, yeah, you know, when you're a big super fan like that, uh they, your hero comes in the room. You're like, Oh God, what do I ask this guy? That's not yeah. going to make me sound stupid, you know, or some question he hasn't heard already a thousand times before. Yeah. I think I got through it. Okay. He looks like 20 times cooler than anything I've ever seen. Like he's up there with <laughs> Cornell, Chris Cornell and yes, those yes. guys. He was just such a yeah. cool dude. He still is man. And, uh, uh, yeah, I can, I can and see. I, I've, yeah. I've, I've run cross paths with him, you know, since that first interview that I did with him and I was kind of nervous. And the more you see him, the more you get a little more comfortable. And it's, it's always, hey, how's it going, buddy? That kind of thing. That's uh, good. But to have to sit there and actually come up with questions and not sound like an amateur, <laughs> that, I, was, I was pretty nervous. I was pretty nervous. You're a pro, David. You're a pro. Get in your head. Get in your head. Yeah, I, can, I can do this. I can do this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man so uh you th- this has got to be what's hard for you because we, we talked about hog mollies which i dug and i remember actually going to um the office in lubbock and i went to go see mm-hmm. hog mollies and uh i can't think of his name right now but the bassist knew me and it was so i was oh, so yeah. freaked out that they, he knew who i was <laughs> i don't know why i was freaked yeah. out that he knew who i was but he knew who i was and um yeah craig Craig, yeah. yes, Craig. Craig yeah. And that, now I see Craig yeah. at shows us on my Outlaws and Legends Festival when I played it last year. He is such a cool dude. Um, loving it I, out with that guy. Was I actually he? saw Rody Morrow last night. Uh, we were doing our show, Texas FM Live, which you've been a, a guest on before. We're out there at Cook's Garage. Yeah. And uh, Rody, Rody came. It's been, you know, after being locked down for so long, it's nice to actually see another human face, or especially one that you haven't seen in a while. Rody, Rody's looking good, man. Rody, 
Murphy Morris, the lead singer, made the guy that writes most of the songs for the Hog Mollies, um, family man, hardworking guy, guy I have a lot of respect for. But it was really good to see him last night. He looks he looks healthy. So great, Miss Smith. So uh, backstage, things crazy things happen. Uh, I know that a lot of the DJs, whenever I say like, I want you to tell me your favorite backstage story, like, I'm not gonna tell you my favorite. Uh, but, but yeah, if you, got, if you got any that uh, that you can share with us, man, uh, or anything that you just can remember off the top of your head, this is always a well, weird question to ask DJs. The, the the those I wish I, there's a lot of that stuff that I wish I would have had somebody take a picture of that moment while me and Larry and Joe are sitting around talking or you know what I mean those, those are the moments I I really love visiting with the artist you're right I'm not going to go into some of the finer details that go on backstage you can imagine what things are like backstage uh, but I do remember one that was just it was just crazy that just stood out as uh, LJT Larry Joe Taylor you've got sixty thousand people out there in the crowd and everything everybody's going crazy having a good time and it just starts pouring rain. Right? I mean, it's just soaking in rain. And there was this neat moment where we all kind of huddled up and you've been backstage at LJT before, you know, that, that little, uh, little annex building that's back there right behind the stage. Yes. There was probably a hundred people back there all sitting around drinking, having a good time. We had our own little party there for about a full hour waiting for the rain to pass. And that was a neat moment. I, and cause there was, it was everybody, everybody was there. Uh, you're sitting there and you've got, uh, uh, Shane Smith and the saints in the corner. And then you've got, uh, uh, Kevin Fowler hanging out, you know, handing you a shot, and William Clark Green flipping the bird at everybody. I mean, it was just this really neat moment of these who, you know, the guys that everybody knows these artists, you know, yeah. these these rock stars. And I'm just kind of in the middle, being like, don't don't do anything stupid, you know, don't don't stand <laughs> out too much, don't get kicked out of this cool moment right here. I mean, most of those guys we've known them for so long, it's it's like family now, and that's what I miss, you know, not having LJT this year in April. I was so looking forward to that family reunion that we had. Oh, yeah. And, of course, they postponed that to October, and hopefully that happens. But it's that one – I don't know what it is. It's just that camaraderie that you get backstage. And, I, and unless you're a part of it, unless you've actually been around it, it's hard to describe into words. It's just this it's, – it's like a family reunion with rock stars. I, I love – don't get me wrong. I love seeing the performances of these artists. They put a lot of work into them. They, you know, the way they set up their set, their set list and everything. So it's a, there's a craft. There's, a, there's an art to what their performance on the main stage. And I enjoy that. Um, prefaced all that with that but the part i think i probably like the most about ljt is the after hours sitting around the campfires drinking beers with friends and passing a guitar around amongst yeah. other things you know so <laughs> <laughs> just saying fun, fun nights man and there's <laughs> there's such great people and everybody has such a good vibe and i was told this before i went there but i was very lucky to start hanging out with you and and uh, uh oh, you just you we're lucky to have you man james cook nah, man get out Come here, on. Man. Yeah, stop, stop, <laughs> uh, let's let's i'm gonna ask you just a couple of rapid fires uh sure, sure. That blew you away first time you heard them oh it was reckless kelly without a doubt yeah. and it was um you know this i never saw them play the wormy dog but they played this I think it was like a fourth of july outdoor concert and a friend of mine was like, man, if you like Cross Canadian Ragwood, you're going to love Reckless Kelly. And he brings me along. And I mean, just jaw to the floor the first time I saw them live. Talk about a, I mean, just an amazing group of musicians. Those guys are flawless. And their performance is unbelievable. And it's still that way. I saw them play a couple years ago, LJT we're talking about, and nothing, they still have that same energy they had from 15, 20 years ago that they still have today. Awesome. And uh, it's, yeah, the Reckless Kelly, one of the best live shows you'll ever see. Greatness. Uh, being a DJ, it's got some. It's got some quirks. It's got some good stuff. What's the sure. best thing that you can talk about uh, with your job? The, the access, I, I, because I am such a huge fan, and I love to be there and hear the story. So the, the access is is great. Um, you know, I, and, and being and, and being just watching the music develop. You know, watching these guys write songs, sitting in the studio with guys like Dalton Domino, um, that's cool. I mean, that's stuff that. You know, I'll remember it for the rest of my life, and not everybody gets to do that. And I'm that's aware great. of that. I'm aware of how lucky I am to have access to that. And so that's definitely the, the biggest perk. I'd say. Great. What's the worst thing about your job? Yeah. <laughs> I think you probably, I think you'll probably know about this one. You being a radio guy yourself, is when the big concert's about a day or two away, and the phone is going off nonstop from your friends. Friends, uh, get those quotes in there. Your friends, your best buddies, they're going, hey, buddy, you got tickets to the concert? And I'm going, man, come on now. <laughs> Two days before I've got a lot the show. Of best friends. Yeah. Right before the show starts, uh, I've, I've got a lot of best friends. Tons of <laughs> and that's probably one of those annoying. And I, the reason why I want to bring that up is think about that next time you, you, you know, if you're not in regular contact or real close with maybe a James Cook, 
And then all of a sudden, the day before the big concert, you start calling James Cook. I mean, this, I don't know if we're – you, you, you kind of oh, sound you, like an I, ass when you do that. Dude, I, I, get, I get it all the time. This is me right before a major concert. Who? That's me every <laughs> single time. I don't know, I don't know that person. I, I don't know how we became friends. Do have I seen you before? Like I, I know that sounds rude, but most of the time it's like, who is this? Yeah. Well, bro, I bought you a shot at the bar three years ago. You don't remember me? I'm, no, I don't. I don't. I'm sorry. So, it's three years ago, and you bought me a shot. And you're asking me for for tickets. And besides, don't ask for tickets in the first place. Pay the money to go see the show of the band that you support. Yeah. Uh, if you like that band, pay the cover. That's helping them get down the road to the next show. You know that, man. I mean, you're oh. you're a traveling musician yourself. Yeah, they you know, buy the, the merch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've got a method that I've used that my brother used to use in order to get into my shows all the time. Uh, he would go up to the door guy, and then he would look at the door guy, and then he would look at the band and point to them. And even if the band didn't know him, the band would always go, "Hey, what's up?" Okay. And my brother, hey, would what's up? Point at them, and then look See? at the door guy and go, "I'm here." <laughs> I'm here. And then walk right in with any, <laughs> that is almost like, brilliant. I'm, I'm supposed to be here, man. You know that he looks at the yeah. points at him. They'll say, what's up. And he'll go, I'm here. And then he'll just walk right in. Uh, my brother. Or just geez. look like you're a musician and you get anywhere you want to go. So, you know, the long hair, the brim cap, you know, the it out shirt. back here. If you don't know, <laughs> Pearl snap shirt will do it too. It gets you there. there you uh, we've been uh, talking with my great friend and radio personality from uh, Lubbock. He now works at Texas FM 93.1. Catch him on your radio dial whenever you're up there in Lubbock. Uh, Mr. David Wild. David, man, thank you for sharing your life with us today. Really, truly. Absolutely. It. Thank you so man, much. Man, I miss you. As soon as, as soon as you're ready to get out on the road, holler at me. We're going to get you on our Thursday show, okay? Boom. Sounds like a plan. You guys All check right, out every Thursday night from Cook's Garage. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, buddy. All right, buddy. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. If you like what you saw, please like and subscribe to the page today. I'm gonna to be posting up a new video every Wednesday. And if you wanna see another interview, you can check out one of these bad boys right here. Thank you so much.